And we are live. What is going on, everybody? We have just absolutely a treat for you tonight. Um, absolutely amazing music producer, bassist, engineer, educator, worked with, I, I, I can't imagine, you've worked with Willie Nelson, seven oh, or eight wow. other people that we love. We've had South for, for the Winter on somebody he's actually produced and if you can go check him out on soundcloud we have him on tonight his name is matt lee what's going on hey guys Hello. thanks Hello, for having me this is so fun i love the show we yeah, have, thanks for being with us. yeah totally and we've had a blast doing this show it's been just absolutely fun we've enjoyed uh yeah what a blast it's been this is episode i think we're on episode 16 it's crazy uh, so seven- it says seventeen on the uh, on the thing. Is it seventeen? Am I am I me just even doing that wrong? Holy moly! Okay. Seventeen. I'm All giving right. an extra week. Seventeen, 17 full week of us doing and having really awesome times with musicians. This is a blast. Thank you so much for coming on, Matt. We oh, appreciate yeah. everybody else who's been coming on. Below, you're going to see a link. I want you guys all to click on this link later. Later. But go check out, check this link out. It has all of his SoundCloud music, and he has all of the people that are probably the most recent people that he's been working with on SoundCloud. We have we have uh, the South for the Winter folks on there. A couple really great tunes from them, and absolutely amazing other bands. I saw a gospel band in there. Absolutely yeah. loved it. Uh, it was yeah, really it was awesome. Great. Yeah, great selection. Um, so Matt, we're going to get to desserts. This is where we go. We're, we're going to talk about desserts right now, and we're going to have some fun. So I'm going to tell you that I already know what Matt brought, and I think he has, I think he's beat everybody tonight. I think he has beat everybody tonight, but let's go ahead and see what Matt has brought for desserts tonight. We got the uh, well, competition. Had to go, had to go with my favorite. This is uh tiramisu from a, a local Italian bakery. So I kind of went all out. I had a chance to eat some dessert while getting interviewed. And how often there did you go? So I, right. I, splurged. I splurged a little bit tonight. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, that's tiramisu is so good. That is like one of oh, my favorite I mean, so Italian desserts ever. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not. I'm. I'm just gonna get. I'm just gonna bump in here because I already know that he made amazing stuff, and I'm just gonna go that I didn't. I just went with Rice Krispie Treats, but with something extra that I'm going to say that's going to take me over the top because it flies kind of into your mouth. It is a bomb pop. With, it's not only a bomb pop. I'm going to tell you that, that we found these bomb pops that have things that look like seeds in them. They're candy with seeds in them, and it just fell on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't fly very far. <laughs> Okay, well, that's the end of that. It was a bomb pop. It has seeds in it, and it just completely <laughs> melted into my lap. <laughs> this is live, guys. This is not pre-recorded. Yeah, that's right. This is live. <laughs> why dropping, you need to keep? Dropping, why you need? He's, I'm he's dropping bombs. bomb pops here. <laughs> ah. <laughs> dropping bombs. Dropping the bombs. Um. So, my friend James, what do you got, buddy? Uh, I got some homie brownies. You can't beat some brownies. Homie brownies oh, as well. Oh, homie so, brownies. Yeah. Homie brownies. There you homie go. Homie brownies. See, and you know what the thing about him is, is they're not just like homemade brownies from a box that I try to make. No, they're no. like homemade brownies <laughs> with the flour and the you stuff. Cut the chocolate the, down himself, you know. But, that's right. <laughs> Travel the club. They're just chocolate chips. They're just chocolate chips. Oh, yeah. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> made my own cocoa. Yeah. I'll make my own cocoa. That's what I heard. I heard you have a plant in the back. <laughs> Toast off my own. own uh, milks his own cows. Beans, yeah. Milks yeah. his own cows. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Churns his own butter. Yep. Um, yeah. So, Matt, we're going to ask you a couple of questions about food, of all things, amazingly enough. So we love to start it off with what is your favorite on the road food to eat? So if you're going to do a base gig somewhere, what is it that you have to have in your arsenal for food for that day? 
Man, honestly, whatever anybody's serving up, especially if it's free or provided by the venue, I honestly do not care. But that's what tastes better too. So it does. Whatever yeah, it's free, free somebody's it making it so much better. <laughs> free ninety nine, yeah. the best, <laughs> it's the best deal ever. But uh, man, when, when on my my days on the road, we we went to every fast food restaurant you can imagine, and I'm not gonna lie, guilty pleasure for me is a Big Mac from McDonald's. I, yeah. Yeah, it gets me every time, you know. I, I know it's bad for me. I know I'm not supposed to eat it, but I could I could go for a Big Mac just about any any day of the week. So uh, <laughs> I don't do that very often. But when we were on the road, that, that was always a a treat. When McDonald's ended up becoming the the place that we'd stop at. <laughs> I will say that I I I have kids. And then we just overdid Big Macs because of the fact that they were like, I want Happy Meals. So I was like, oh, yeah, let's have. And then I was like on this dilemma. And this is our dilemma. Were Big Macs better and McDonald's better in the 70s and 80s than they were now? And I think that they were. Yeah. I think as a kid, I think that there was something better about the food back then. And I don't know what it was. Maybe it's just I'm old now and have well, because then like you're being just being introduced, your your mind and your soul <laughs> is being introduced <laughs> to McDonald's. Now it's just like hey, it's McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it's it's not as new anymore. <laughs> when billions and billions have been served, it's uh, it's not that's as good. right. Well, this is my interesting story. So we lived in England and there was two McDonald's in in England at the time, like two in London. And so when we went to London, that was our big treat. We'd go, we don't have, we haven't had McDonald's in forever. So it was like, we went and found them and they are definitely not the same in England, especially no. during that time. It was like, they were bad. Their chocolate shake, shakes tasted funny. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> maybe they were trying to use real chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but their their ice cream machine actually worked. That's the difference. You know, you're, you're not used to actually getting a milkshake, and you're like, Wait, "What is this creamy frozen beverage? I, I've never had one of these in America." That's right. You know, it's funny. There's actually a video. I won't get too much into it. There's a video if you look on YouTube. There's where a guy kind of breaks down. Like he looks in the whole the whole conspiracy of like the every McDonald's. Like why? Because it has to do with the machines. Because like different uh, fast food chains use the same company for machines, mm -hmm. and uh, it's got to do with with the company itself or whatever. But it's like it's a whole it's like a twenty minute video, and this dude just goes really he dives head first right into why. Um, oh man, it's something to do with the machines and stuff like that too. Like the machines will do, like a uh, give it error codes and stuff like that, and when yeah. it doesn't need to be an error code, it's 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 crazy. Like like I watched the whole the whole twenty minutes of it. It's, it's crazy. And then four hours later, you're still researching why are McDonald's <laughs> machines always off or not working? <laughs> and so that, that's not a, that's one of those uh, that's one of those black hole rabbit holes that you you just get that 20 minute video and now your mind yeah. you can't, can't get out of your own head. <laughs> he got into I like need to know. Like, he got into saying something like there was like even in like the the book the repair book there's like a guy that fixes the machines like they call him the guy <laughs> like, it's crazy this is what's so funny so uh my wife works for a company that is the guy so she does commercial refrigeration really? and she services those machines and they are absolutely right it is the machine uh yeah. different machines there's different quality machines and mcdonald's buys the cheapest ones and if you go to Sonic, they're usually like the higher end ones, usually the Sonic. Sonics can go somewhere else, but Sonics and Dairy Queen, they use really much more higher end machines. And that's the reason why their ice cream tastes so much better. Also the product. I mean, there is product involved in it too. That's <laughs> no. <laughs> one's ice milk. One's like not ice milk. Flavored <laughs> milk. Beverage, yeah. Flavored milk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One's <laughs> vanilla milk. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, so just anything. You know what? That is the college motto right there. And he's just living it still. He's like, that's you know that's so funny. My dad, who is a musician too, that's his motto too. Like, hey, if it's free, it's good food right there. Yeah. Yeah. If it's right. given. 
what is your uh so what is the best meal you've ever been served on the road then if you've been like what is it's like mm. somebody serving up like something crazy for you Man. if mcdonald's if mcdonald's like your guilty pleasure what's something that's like the, the best like coup de gras like thing that you've had on the road Wow, man, that's a tough, uh, tough question. Maybe a shot of tequila. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That works. Well, the reason the reason I say that is uh, we were playing a show in Cherokee, North Carolina. We were playing the Harrow's Casino there, and Ron White was actually performing in their big auditorium. We were in just their crappy little country bar that they had there, and he was playing. He was headlining their main auditorium. And we were playing the late shift, so he came down and listened to us play. I was playing with some artists at the time, and, and then he ended up buying us a shot of tequila. And so uh, I will say, though, even though he was really nice, he bought us cheap tequila, which <laughs> all of you out there listening, if you're ever going to buy the band tequila, at least buy Patron or higher. You know, right. As, as a request right. for all fellow musicians, <laughs> um, at least start with Patron, you know, and then, and then right. go from there. But. Uh, yeah, man. Best uh, best meal is tough. I, there, I don't know that I've I could pinpoint the best one I've had while working on the road, but um, definitely some maybe more when I've been working more as producer and an engineer. Um, I was doing some work up in Seattle several years ago, and ended up stopping at a place called Buddha Ruska. They have the best chicken dish it's a tie um, yeah other than that i love sushi so anytime i go to la to work i always stop off at sugarfish that's my favorite probably my favorite place to, to eat so if i'm working near the coast or working near somewhere else i try to find something unique you lose me yeah, we lost you for a second, but I think we're back. We're back. Okay. Where, yeah, where, we're good now. Where did uh where did you leave off? Or where did it where the did you Buddha, the there? Buddha the Buddha and then we said something oh, about Thai food. I think Buddha it was Ruska, Thai food. yeah. Buddha Ruska in Seattle. They have this chicken dish. It's garlic, ginger, all kinds of good stuff. And it's it's one of the best chicken dishes I've ever eaten. I'm a big uh food network star, uh, show uh fan. I love yeah. it. My girlfriend and I watch that all the time. And there's a show on there called Best Thing I Ever Ate. And so anytime they have that show, I'm always thinking like, what's the best one of these things that I've eaten? And you start thinking like, you know, chicken, that's a hard one to think about because it's so basic and everybody has chicken. But yeah. like, that's one of those meals that you never really forget. But uh, like I was saying, uh, I'm also a big sushi fan. So being here in Nashville, we have a couple places that are okay. But nothing like being on the coast, you know, places where you know they caught the fish that morning. Yeah, when you're close to the water, you're more like, okay, they got some good stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're you're a little bit more trusting too. It's like, are you yeah. sure this is actually you know what you say it is? <laughs> right. That's so true. That's so true. So you were doing work. Who were you doing work with in Seattle? You're allowed to say. Is it like uh, all? Co yeah, yeah. I have a a, a good friend um, who I was out visiting. Uh, drummer, uh, and I'm going to forget his last name, of course, but uh, a guy I used to work with here in Nashville, he moved out there with his girlfriend and went out to visit him and, and doing some work. Oh, and he was the one that totally actually introduced fun. me to uh, to the place. But uh, yeah, it was it was that's great. cool. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. What was your first like uh, band, like band, the like first band you worked with, like the name of like, how did you, you know, how did you meet the first band that you ever got with? If you can yeah. remember that far back, or how, how long have you how long have you been doing it, like uh, all together? Yeah, so the very first band I ever worked with was actually my own, and okay. it was one I was 19 years old and got a bunch of my friends that I had played with all through high school and, and everything else, and wrote all these songs and we went into the studio, and I ended up basically paying for the sessions, so I got to be the producer. Uh, that's usually okay. how it works. If you're the one fronting the money, you get to be producer. Hey, there you go. Uh, that was a band called Cruise Control. So there, our music's still out there. It's a, a jazz fusion project. Nice. And uh, that was the first one. But the first band that I wasn't a part of was here in Nashville. It was a group called the Japanese Cowboys. 
which is <laughs> That's awesome. nobody in the, nobody was in the band was Japanese or a cowboy. <laughs> so it was it was very, very random. But <laughs> but I met a couple really great musicians in that group who I still work with to this day. And uh, you know, that was definitely an interesting experience. But all really great people and then, you know, cool music and and we had a we had a really good time. And what kind of music was it? They were a rock band. Rock kinda, band. Somewhere between classic rock and indie rock. Nice. You know, back at that point in time, that was kind of Kings of Leon. They were at their peak. So every rock band in Nashville sounded like Kings of Leon. And then a couple years later, they all sounded like the Black Keys. And then a couple years later, they all sounded like Mumford and & Sons. And, and you know, it, it, it tends to happen. But Do you, That's the thing that's interesting. And that's something about music. And that's something about human nature, I think, that I, I think about is, is that how... Like you think about glam rock, why was glam rock so big? It's because somebody made kind of glam rock happen and then everybody else kind of went on. Like Motley Crue, where did they come from? What, like, what was the thing that kicked it all off? And you know, you start going back and you're like, oh, that's that group. It was like, oh, Kiss kind of kicked it off. And then other people started going, everybody in LA was looking for another band like, you know, Motley Crue. And then there's LA Guns came in. And then you have all these other. Guns and Roses show up out of nowhere, and then all suddenly everybody's Seattle. No, we want Seattle bands. We all want everybody looks like grunge rock. And then you go to new metal, and then you keep going indie rock. Now indie rock is like a total. That's completely changed. Like there's not there's different versions of indie rock now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Everything's been so compartmentalized that you really have to kind of go seeking out. Um, you know, you really have to kind of know what you're looking for to seek out new work and new artists. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised there aren't more radio stations that have just a, an all around variety of all styles of music. You know, wouldn't it be great to have a radio station that played everything from country to rock, to jazz, to pop, to, you know, it covers multiple decades, you know, think right. about how many years now we've had really solid recorded sound Really, if we go, if we want to go back to like when it's really, really great and really high quality, we'd go back probably to the 1940s. That's where I was just going to say big band. Yeah. 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 And that, that's probably our, our starting point for high fidelity audio. But imagine a radio station that picked music from all different genres and, and all right. different eras. You know, that, that, I think that would be really cool to have something like that. But, that would probably be the real pop radio because that's really the popular music throughout time is True. that yeah. is that stuff absolutely yeah. but there's so I, much music out there you know how do you how do you pick and choose and where do you go to find it and that's yeah that's the challenge and it's a lot of it too just by popularity like uh, if somebody listens to it or you know if it's by request or whatever if radio picks it up it's like and then the radio station is playing it over and over and over along with other stuff that you hear on the regular radio not even on like spotify or anything like that yeah. Just on regular car radio, um, you play just song. You hear songs that are just played over and over and over, and they just get old, you know, quick, because um, it's just the same thing instead of just going towards. Because like I said, there's so much music out there. Oh yeah. And with the radio, is just it's like a set of like ten songs or whatever, twenty songs, and that's it. <clears throat> it's it's crazy to me that we live in a time with so much music available, and we don't there's so much that it's almost overload to where yeah. i mean you go on the instagram and i mean there are so many musicians just there's some guy just playing a guitar yeah. i'm just playing a riff of something and they're everybody's trying to make it and it's so such a different environment than it was up until you know and up until the internet well i would say even up at instagram like 10 years ago mm -hmm things all changed i mean it was yeah. napster kind of changed it up and that was one of the first real introduction to real change of the music industry and now you add the fact that they have pro tools out there fruit loops you don't even have to have like expensive studio you know you you have an ipad you can create an album yeah like, it's just you're, it's not going to sound as good as something you're using with Pro Tools, or at least the Pro version of Pro Tools, right? Right. Um, but you're you can still produce anything. Like Billie Eilish was sitting in her room with her fam, with her brother, right? 
making amazing, doing some amazing stuff. And a lot of it has to be, it's all studio based. You know, she's, she's really the product of really good music producing tools mm -hmm. that are yeah. available to anybody in their house. Mm -hmm. And so now you have this plethora of crazy and it's hard to get made. I, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine being a musician trying to make it in this day and age because it's so hard it's not the same way the rules have all changed and the money definitely isn't what it used to be well especially like how people you know bands or musicians have to pay for studio time now you can just get home <laughs> like you don't need you know well that's yeah, like, go in the closet and put a uh, like buy a couple hundred dollar microphone and some you know from some foam and stuff like that to soundproof it and you're good but here's the thing, and this is why I want to talk to Matt. And it is, but there's an art to what he does. So there's what people do with. I just have some Pro Tools and stuff, right? Stuff. Then there is what Matt's doing, and you can distinctly tell that there is this this art that goes into producing and engineering this music. Oh, totally. Um, and you can tell the distinct difference in the way that when you listen to the in it for, for those folks go to his soundcloud you will see you will hear the difference not see the difference mm -hmm. hear the difference <laughs> because <laughs> you can you can hear how he mic'd it yep. you can hear how the ambient noises in the back and how he had to mic it in different places around his studio to pick up that quality of sound and you can't do that from your house all the time. You have to no, know something. If there's an even distribution of sound, or it's, absolutely, yeah, that, that's where you you can tell. Like I said, you can tell quality from where you're at. So, and so that's what my question for you is, Matt. What is it that you're doing that is? I mean, your sound is amazing. What is it that got you into this? And then what is it that, I mean, you are, you're a Grammy award winner for a reason because your sound quality is so amazing. And the way you're producing this, what goes into this? And then for people who don't know what goes into this, what goes into this? And then additionally, um, what is it that you're looking for when you're like, because a producer is pulling things out of a musician or an engineer is pulling stuff out of a musician that sometimes they don't even have, they don't even realize they have. Right. So what is it that goes into your thought process? And then also what is it that you're doing? Yeah. Great question. And you know, one of the things I think is really interesting is four or five years ago, getting back to what you were saying about the Instagram world is that nobody was really playing guitar or really doing anything, you know, on YouTube or anything like that, that was focused on that. And there's been, definitely a resurgence in the last couple of years of musician and focusing on the actual playing of instruments again, which I think is, is really awesome and really wonderful because there was a point a few years ago where the number one thing that kids wanted to be when they grew up was a YouTube star. You know, it wasn't professional athlete. It wasn't rock star. It wasn't famous musician. It was, they want to be a YouTube star. And, and so I think that's uh, it's cool that we're starting to see it kind of shift back to people taking that idea of YouTube star, but applying it to also, you know, making the world a better place through music or teaching people how to do things. But um, that kind of takes me back to when I was a kid. You know, I've, I started playing guitar when I was 14 years old, 13 years old, something like that. And once I got a taste of it, it's like I, I know that this is what I want to do with my life. I want to play music. And I didn't really find out I wanted to make music and be on the other side of the glass until a few years later. But once I had that taste of being in a recording studio and, you know, you have really long days, sometimes you're there for 12, 14, 16 hours and you go home and you just feel like, well, you're completely exhausted because you're focusing that whole time. But you also I, I'd never had a sense of accomplishment like I had that very first time you know, leaving the studio after a super long day. And it, it, to me, that was my calling is like, this is what I was put on this earth to do was to make music, help other people make the best music that they can. And, you know, I'm going to make it my life's career and my life's work to try to figure out how do we make the best sounding record possible. And so I've been really fortunate to learn some of those things that make records sound amazing 
And I'll give you a little secret. The first one, and a lot of people don't realize this, and this is something I have to teach my students and, and really kind of harp on, but the number one thing that's going to affect how your record sounds are the musicians and the talent that you're recording. So there are other factors that are really important, but if you have people that don't know how to play their instruments, don't know how to sing or write crappy songs, then you're not gonna, it's, it's not gonna sound great at the end of the day or the end of the process. So that's number one. Number one, you gotta have great source material. And I've been very, very fortunate in my career to get to work with a lot of people that are way more talented than you'd ever imagine or ever guess. Uh, the second part of that is where you record that source material and the quality of the instruments that they're using. Those two factors also play a big role in how something's going to turn out. So you have to have great people and a great place with great instruments. And then lastly, the gear that you use. So the microphones, the outboard gear, the consoles, everything leading up to that all plays into getting the superb radio quality sound. And what's interesting, you know, you talked about how a lot of people are mostly focused on kind of doing stuff themselves at home on a laptop, maybe on an iPad. And that's great. You know, it's a, I'm a proponent of if you have the ability to make music, make it like get it out there. Let your voice be heard. Um, what we are finding, though, in the studio world is that a lot of artists who grew up with access to always be able to make the music at home or make it themselves are starting to say, no, we want to go actually and record it in a real studio that has this gear that, you know, I, I certainly can't afford on my own and some of these other musicians can't afford on their own. But right. we want to go there almost kind of like the, the vinyl revolution we've had in the last 10 years. The idea of going and actually doing your album in a studio kind of has a novelty to it. And, and bands are now able to use that to promote on Instagram and promote on YouTube and some of these other places and TikTok where they're able to say, look at this great video we shot of us making our next record. And look, we're in a classic studio that's been here for 40, 50 years that had all of these big time artists that have recorded here. And so that's been really cool to kind of see a revival of recording studios coming back and, and people really realizing I'm not going to get that same quality of sound unless I'm in a space that was designed, built and made for that particular purpose. So anyways, that's, that's my whole career in about, or what I'm do, what I do for a living in about uh, what six or seven minutes of me talking straight. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Mark I was awesome. watching oh. something on Studio City, and so I'm a big, huge Nirvana fan, and so was watching David Grohl's kind of his. He did a thing on YouTube about Studio City and a lot of the history, kind of flashing through some of the memoirs of Studio City and how they kind of you know made nirvana happen uh because of the maybe it was the nirvana too but like what you said it was the band and the quality of the studio that helped make that whole never mind happen and you know stevie nicks and so, and i think also tom petty worked with at the studio city um because if you went to those places you'd be like uh this is a, just a junk hole this is a horrible place <laughs> but it's the quality of what they know what to do you know they know how to produce the sound that you're looking for now this is a question that they had and this is what i've asked uh, actually i had a, a conversation with uh jonathan last week about it because he's he's an engineer as well mm -hmm. um analog or digital what is your favorite to work with yes <laughs> good answer uh, it, honestly, good answer um i i love both you know i'm I've never been somebody that's been bogged down by the gear. You know, I, I will figure out a way to make whatever we have available. You know, that's, that's what I, my job is as an engineer. Now I love turning knobs. I love analog gear. I love stuff that's old and I love stuff that's new, but to me at the end of the day, it, honestly, it doesn't really matter all that much. The, 
like the, what I always tell people is the best microphone you have is the one that you own. So, you know, we kind of get caught up in saying, well, if I just had this piece of gear or if I just had, you know, this preamp or I just had this guitar, you know, a lot of that is, um, well, part of my French, but a lot of that's kind of bullshit. And so, you know, you want to remember what we're doing here. We're trying to make music. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love having analog gear. I'm, I'm really fortunate to be able to work in a studio that has access to a lot of really great stuff. And if you have the ability and you have the funds and the means to be able to afford to go into a place that has a lot of analog gear, highly recommend it and use it. You know, if you go to a studio and the engineer is like, oh, we're not using any of this stuff today, tell them to stop whatever they're doing and start plugging stuff in because you're paying all that money to go spend in a studio to have access to those great pieces of gear. So if you have it, use it. That's usually my motto. It's also, I think that you can have a great studio, but also the producer that is looking at it and getting the sounds and being able to do something with the music that was created. So pre-production pre-production is what you're talking about. Make sure you're at the right studio. But post-production, what is it when you're doing post-production stuff? What is it you're looking for? What is it you're trying to? What things are you listening for definitively to start creating the sound that you're going to produce to be able to sell to other folks and get them out, the, you know, helping them create the best sound for their band? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things for me, the way, because I always get the question, how do you know when something's done? How do you know when, when something's, uh, when something's finished? And it's tough because you do kind of battle the, well, what if we just add this? Or what if we just change this? Or what if we make this different? And, you know, a lot of it starts with the band and a conversation or the artist and as a producer, my job is to ensure that the vision of that artist for that particular project, it's to ensure that we achieve that. You know, if they say we want to make an art piece that is a 30 minute song, you know, then we have to take the steps to achieve that 30 minute song and be as artistic as we can versus the person that says, I want this to be on the radio. I, w I don't want it to go over three minutes and 30 seconds. That's too much. And I want this to sound as pop as it possibly can. So you have to take all those things. You have to have those really serious conversations into consideration. And then my job is constantly checking. Are we hitting that mark? Are we achieving these sounds that we set out to achieve? And then lastly, I have a really good friend who works in live sound. He's a really prominent mixer. He worked with Joe Bonamassa and, and worked for a big Oprah show up in Chicago and did all these, all these huge things. And he always says, uh, um, he's like, well, I mix for me, you know, I mix and I produce so that I am hearing what I want to hear. And I think that's so true. I think the best producers and engineers and, and mixers and artists, I think they make music that they want to hear themselves. And they're fortunate when other people also want to listen to that. So for me, when I get done working on a song, I listen to it from top to bottom. And if I don't immediately say, I want to go back and listen to that again, I keep working on it. So I get to that point where I say, man, that was, that was really cool. Let's play it again. And then I do that again. Let's right. play it again. Right. So if I'm, if I'm, if I've become a fan of the song, I know at this point that I need to trust my instincts and know that that's good and that we've achieved that vision. And so when it's done is when I'm saying this song is rocking my socks off or this song, uh, you know, I'm going to be the biggest proponent of this song now, maybe even more than the artist, because I love it. I love what I've done here. I would listen to this a million times in a row and still want to listen to it again. Right. That's Absolutely. awesome. And I what I noticed really about a lot of the songs, I could hear the crispness in the guitar. Yeah. I could hear 
the drum it like it sounds like the net there's nothing that it sounds like the drum that you played that they played it doesn't sound like something that you added a bunch of stuff to to make it digitally sound different i hear reverb i i heard some good reverb in there on some of the songs that you had in there um and so I, and I, I knew that you knew when to turn it off and when to turn it on. It wasn't like left on reverb. You had it like in some choruses, you had uh, a couple times where you added the reverb to help kind of add to the chorus a little bit. Um, and I absolutely love that. Is it sometimes, is it mic placement or is getting that crisp sound or is it just knowing how to put the mics in a certain way for a certain instrument? Yeah, so, you know, it's a combination, but some of that is stuff that comes through in the mixing process, you know, after the band has kind of left the studio and we are trying to bring out all of those great aspects of their music. Oh, puppy dog! <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, for me, I've always kind of had the idea that if I'm going to listen to a record, I need to be able to hear every part that's playing. And so a lot of it for me comes through EQ and equalization. You know, that's where I feel like my bread and butter is as a mix engineer and as a producer, is I know a lot of the tricks and techniques to be able to bring out that crispness and those sounds. And I've always really been drawn to the music production and sound that did have that really clean, sleek, really just kind of over the top production. You know, I've, I'm a huge fan of eighties music, not just like hair metal, but pop eighties pop and early nineties pop kind of right before that grunge scene hit there, you know, basically like you want a great example of what that might sound like uh, stings, 10 summoners tail. I think that's what it's called or summoners. I'm, I'm going to have to look that up, but you know, that's one of those records that you just hear that, that perfection and that cleanness or uh, there's a Phil Collins record that came out in like 90, 91 that had, uh, let's see, what is it called? Something happened on the way to heaven with all the horns and everything else. And, and so when I'm, when I'm making music, that's kind of like my pinnacle of, if I can get it to sound like these things that I love, then I think I'm going to achieve that crispness and that, that clarity. You know, we're always trying to create clarity, right? That I am. I think that's probably my, my biggest underlying theme with any group that I work with is we're trying to clarify what the message is. And we're trying to clarify what all of the different elements that make up that message Right. And it is 10 summoners I was thinking shape of my heart. That was the song that I was thinking. Well, that's on, that's on that record. It that is yep. on that record. And, um, if I ever lose my faith in you is on that record. And I mean, there's a ton of hits that he had that were from just that one album. And I think it is something to do with the way that I, I so I was listening to that the other day cause I heard somebody actually, uh, play, that song again and they were like doing something on instagram i was like i love that song i love the intro i love the guitar part but that's what brings you in mm -hmm. the guitar part because it was so crisp so solidly set against everything else and you could hear it and it was it was like a voice mm -hmm. to me it was like another voice in the song that it was like okay this isn't just he's gonna sing and great this is just an the, it had its own track that was so distinct and so musical and so crisp. I thought that it just completely made the sound because it was almost, I think it's almost like an acoustic album, isn't it? For the most part. Yeah. It's, and, it's, it's definitely more on the organic acoustic side of things. You know, there's a few kind of more rock and songs, but you know, I think you, you bring up an interesting point. I've always been drawn to music that not only had a great lyrical and melodic hook, but, those that have great musical hooks too you know like i'm a big i'm a big rush fan and that's a band that you know they had as many great musical licks as they did vocal licks and and riffs and melodies and so finding i think maybe that's why my the music in the records i make is so crisp or it's such a focal point 
because that's that's the part that I really like. You know, I love I love great songs, but not a lot of people really focus on bringing the music out, and and I think that's kind of the vehicle to deliver the message of that song or of that performance. I think you're right. I think that's and that's the distinct difference that and that was what I was kind of pointing out to several people that that's the difference when I heard South for the winter. That was the thing, the Christmas. And that's why people were coming to you to see to get yeah, that type awesome. of sound out of them. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, those guys and Danny, those guys and gal, they're phenomenal musicians, you know, so that, that my job is really easy working with a band like that because they're they're great great songs and they play their instruments right. like freaking badasses they do you know so they do. when when you have that combination that's when you really get to have a lot of fun because i'm not trying to teach them their parts i'm not trying to teach them how to play their instruments we're now taking that and then getting to be creative where it's like, hey, that was cool, but what if we flip that riff on its head and play it backwards in reverse three times as fast divided by two plus one? And they're like, okay, let me show this. Blah, 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 blah. And then it's and it's perfect. You know, so that's um a band like that, you're just really, really fortunate to get to have that much talent. And that makes things so much easier as a producer because now we get to we really get to be creative and have fun. Yeah, and that's what I picked up from that album. Amazing work. Actually, I really liked all of them. I listened to them for the, I always like right when I know that I have a musician coming on, I will start on that Monday or Sunday and just play your stuff nonstop. I won't listen to too many other people's because I want to pick up what your vibe is. What are you trying to as a musician tell people? And I think produ music producing is in that musicianship. It still is creating. It is still going in and saying, this is what I want the audience to hear. And if, from your perspective, yeah, it's not live music, but it is something that somebody is going to listen to with some headphones. Uh, maybe they'll listen to it on a speaker, listen to their car. You want it to sound great in all of those like atmospheres. And still be like, they took away something. Like you're saying, I want to listen to it again. And I did. I wanted to listen to it again and again and again. I can't get enough of that one Stone song. I absolutely love. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's one of my favorite songs from them. And I could tell that it, you have that presence in all of your songs that I had listened to where there was just a really good, like I was saying, crisp. The instruments were brought out and you put them in their places. They were well balanced, and I think that's what James had said earlier. They're well balanced, yeah. To where it sounded like, yeah, I, I don't think I'm not overpowered by some guitars. I'm not overpowered by the by the singer. It's just in perfect balance, and that's what I think you really bring to the table. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and, and thanks for listening to to my work. You know, I really appreciate that too. I actually fun. have a uh, there's actually a question in there uh, earlier. Um, what are some, uh, I guess, popular artists I guess you've worked with? I know I think Andy brought up a, like one or two of them, I think, when we started, but I think they might have missed it. Yeah. Oh, man, quite a few. I've, I've been really fortunate in my career. Oh, let's see. Willie Nelson, I won a Grammy with him last year in 2020, which was cool. Oh, wow. It was, it was weird because I won a Grammy. And then the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. I'm from Kansas City. Go Chiefs. Yeah, nice. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And I'm like, That's this true. is going to be 2020 is going to be the best year ever. And then, you know, that obviously yeah. didn't happen. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, I've worked, uh, I've worked with Willie Nelson, uh, Natalie Grant, who's a contemporary Christian artist. She, man, she makes great records. Um, in that same vein, I worked with Lauren Daigle on a record, another contemporary Christian artist. Worked with Adelita's Way, rock band from Las Vegas. Okay. Really cool yeah. guys. I've worked with, oh man, it's kind of, it's a lot of people. Not to, not to toot my own horn or anything. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, they name all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Whatever you can remember, or like a top uh, five. One, or one of the cooler ones that I got to work with was Ronnie Millsap. Oh, he's cool! A country legend. Okay. Here in Nashville, he's he's blind, but man, he writes some great songs and and he performs like you can't even believe. It's it's absolutely crazy. 
but yeah, it's it's tough to remember them all. I've I've been very fortunate, and, and sometimes they happen so fast that you're like, wait a minute, did I actually just work with that person? Right. You no, know, it's like, or, or congratulations on this record, and you're like, wait a minute, did I work on that? You're like, oh yeah, I guess I did. It was in between this and this. I do. Um, I'll say, ask another question. I think you mentioned earlier about how like kind of have to pick like the right artist or kind of stuff you know what to work with how do you kind of what's your process and like okay i, I want to work with this artist or i want to work with this artist or kind of like how your approach is to to that artist you know whatever you know stuff like that yeah that's a great question for me it comes down to genuineness so okay. when i work with an artist we have a couple long conversations before i start to uh say yes to somebody and you know one of those things is what what are we doing with your artistry are you going to make records that are true to your character and who you are as an artist or are you just trying to chase the trends so you know that's that's one of those things that we really have to kind of hammer out is we're going to make the best record we can and we're going to try to take all of your influences and all of your inspirations and roll that into roll that into a new artist or roll that into a new sound. You know, some of the greats that have done that over the years recently in the last, you know, couple decades, somebody like John Mayer, who you can hear the Eric Clapton influence, you can hear the Stevie Ray Vaughan influence, you can hear the Dave Matthews band influence, but it's not just one of those things. It's, you know, it's it's a combination of all of his influences. So when I'm working with a new artist, I'm really trying to get to the bottom of who they are, where they came from, you know, what inspires them and, you know, how is that going to play into a project that we're going to create? That's awesome. That And that's what I would expect because that's what you're drawing out their talent. I think it's a good, that's what I was reading about and watching and, talking to other folks about is that's what you're really doing as an engineer and a producer is help drawing out the natural talent as well as, you know, you're, you're adding make maybe some musical qualities to it to enhance it, but you're also drawing it out of them right. because you're like, Hey, this is, this is, you have all these influences, but this is you mm -hmm. and this is your sound. I think you're absolutely right. And being able to draw and enhance that and push that out to make them unique, to sound unique. And I think that's re absolutely right because everybody can record the newest, you know, whatever you were like, just like Mumford's and Sonnen's and everybody during the time frames that everybody was trying to listen to them because yeah. everybody, they think they're, they're trying to catch the trend. Right. But being the trend is much much harder and it Certainly. sometimes doesn't pay the paychecks it sometimes it won't work out for you no. but at least it's uniquely who you are as an artist and you can go away at the end of the day saying i gave it all i had and it, it, i didn't i didn't try to be something else that i'm not certainly yeah and you know mumford and sons is a great example because they were a band that was playing that style of music and that kind of sound long before they ever became popular you know it wasn't like oh we're all of a sudden going to start playing fast bluegrass music and throw a few hand claps in here <laughs> and, and now we're you know now we're the biggest band in the world it's like no those guys were doing that stuff for for many years before they ever became a household name so right. that's what you know that's that's what i try to instill in the artists that i work with and and i tell them up front like you know if this is the chase radio stardom or anything like that you're never going to get it you know, you've got to, you've really got to make sure you know who you are and I will help you find that person or find that artist and find that sound, but we can't be chasing the trends. So right. speaking of uh, sound and trends, uh, Gary has a question. What is your opinion on autotune? I love it. Let's more, <laughs> more auto tune the better. Yeah, let's, let's use it. Let's use it. I can tell that was the answer. I can tell that was the answer. <laughs> uh, you know what? It's it's like anything else. It's a tool, and we can use it to make people sound better. We can use it to make people sound crazy. You know, we can use it for creative purposes, and we can make bad people sound better than they than they are. 
you know, it's a, it's a great thing to have, especially when budgets are small and you don't have the luxury of trying to get that vocal take a hundred times in a day or, you know, over the course of a whole week. It's like, well, we got it like 95% of the way there. Auto-tune is going to get us the last 5%. But I think <laughs> like with anything, you know, it's you got to use it in moderation. Like like the, the, this dessert that I'm going to eat tonight. You know, I can't be having tiramisu every night of the week. And, or Big Macs. Like, yeah, or Big Macs. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're just like, I know like what that your does. Favorite, your favorite meal and your favorite dessert, <laughs> moderation is always the uh, always the key. And I think with uh, there was another question. I think a little bit up the way. Uh, I guess with the the future, because you seem like you're pretty, you're still pretty young. I mean, you got you still got a long time. I mean, I don't think you're you're giving you know giving this up anytime soon. Um, what are like some future artists that you that you want to would, would like to work with? Like, what are some good art you know artists out there that you know that you're like, oh, I, I want I really want to work with him or her. Um, well, just from a personal standpoint, I would love to work with the band Dream Theater. You know, yeah, that'd be nice. Guys. I've I've been a fan of them. That would be time, nice, and I think it'd just be really awesome to get it. And their sound is their sound is, man. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. They're one of the few bands that you know has has made a career without ever having any type of radio airplay or any kind. Yeah, of, very true. Really, MTV airplay or any of that kind of stuff. Good choice. But yeah, a band like that would be cool. I mean, I'm I'm a rocker at heart, so you know, name any major rock band, and I probably want to. There you go. And um, as far as like pop stars and stuff go, I, I think it'd be really cool to work with Charlie Puth. I, I've I've had some friends that have worked with him, and and he has, you know, done some really cool stuff. And he's he's a very creative person, so that would be pretty neat. Um, very nice. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many. It, I, uh, it Dream Theater is definitely a Dream Theater is definitely the, a big a big uh, a good choice right there though. Yeah. I think. Yeah, that would be, be the dream. Like if I ever get the uh, if I ever get the opportunity to do that, that would be, you know, nice. I don't need to work anymore because my life is complete. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah, I think that. Um, I was wondering. This is my question: Who has been your favorite artist to work with so far? That's a hard Ooh, question because I know you. Question. Well. You know, and honestly, the majority of the artists that I've had a chance to work with, especially the famous people, are all the majority of them. I will say are, are all really wonderful. Um, but let me tell you, let me tell you one of my favorite moments because I think that's a little bit, a little bit better. It might tell you a little bit more about yeah. kind of my background and stuff. But uh, I was working at a studio and we were working with the band Deep Purple, so. Oh. You know, talking about tasty licks, smoke on the water. Uh, that's usually the first tasty lick that anybody ever learns, myself included. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're working with Deep Purple and, you know, we're kind of, I don't want to say freaking out, but trying to get mentally prepared because these are literal rock stars that you know, they've been around for 50 years and they're coming into our studio to, to do their next record. And we're thinking, well, these guys are going to, you know, they're going to be divas. They're going to require us to go to Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. And then we're going to have to go to the grocery store and they're going to have all these dietary restrictions and lunch is going to take forever because we're going to have to go to all these places. And they showed up and, and every day they ate ham sandwiches, ham and cheese sandwiches and, and Campbell's soup. And it's just such a, a weird disconnect of like, these are literal rock stars and they are eating what I ate as a kid for lunch every day. But uh, the reason I bring that up is there uh, during that session, they decided they needed to re-record smoke on the water for licensing purposes. And so wow. sitting in the room when they played that song, was like holy crap my 13 year old self right now would never ever ever believe that you're right. sitting in the room with the band <laughs> that led to you learning guitar right you know that these are the these are the guys that you're hanging out with and it was cool because three of the original members that recorded that song were on you know they were still part of the band and oh, then wow. the other two guys that are in the band now one of them is Don Airy who is 
you know, look him up. He's he is keyboard legendary royalty. I mean, he played with Rainbow and Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest and all of these huge, huge names. So he was there and he was a, a wonderful guy. And then uh, Steve Morse, who played with Dixie Dregs and a lot of other big names. He's been their guitarist for you know over 20 years. So working with all those guys and getting to know them and again, getting to see Smoke on the Water be re-recorded. Right. Uh, be a part of that. Cool, nice. cool experience. So that's probably been my favorite experience overall. But, you know, as far as people goes, there's been so many. I've been really blessed to, to get to work with a lot. Another one that I learned a lot from, probably the one I learned the most from, is Keb Moe, who's a big modern blues artist. He was kind of the first artist that took me under his wing when I first moved to town many years ago and, you know, just taught me a lot about life, more about music in the couple years that I worked with him than I did in the 15 years prior to that, studying and learning and, and trying to know as much as I could. But yeah, there's so many. I've, I've, I've been really fortunate to learn from top producers and engineers and artists. That's awesome. It's so hard to choose. Well, you live in the right town for it, too. I oh, mean, yeah. Nashville's amazing. I've heard nothing but amazing things about Nashville is just like L.A., you know, it for well, it's, it used to be just a country ma country music mecca, but now it's just music mecca. Mm -hmm. You know that, and you know, LA is kind of kind of. I think it's more. I've actually been told that LA is kind of losing its its luster, and people are moving more back into Nashville, Austin, doing more of that stuff in those areas than than ever have been. And I love the fact that that m musicianship is showing up and wanting to do gigs and have fun, you know, and, and record. Yeah. And Nashville is kind of its own beast because it's the only place where the focus is only music. You know, you take a place like LA, you're contending with the movie industry and the film industry. Right. And you go to a place like New York, you're contending with the theater industry. So I think that's what makes Nashville very unique is that it's literally just music here. Now it's live music and studio music, but everybody here is focused on playing it or creating it. And there's really no other place in the world that's exactly like it, which I think that's why it draws a lot of people here. And, you know, recently the reason it draws a lot of people is because it's kind of the sexy hip spot and it's a little bit cheaper than a couple of those other places we mentioned, yeah. but um, that's changing. It's, it's getting very, very expensive here. It's, or it's gotten more. Expensive that's what, that. That's what uh, Nicole was years. telling me. Yeah. 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 Nicole's told me that she said, um, cause her, so, you know, James, um, he's mm -hmm. on, so James is, James is my boy. I love James. And I and love James Nicole is a good too. Dude. Both, those, both those two yeah. are, they have a special place in my heart. Yeah. Good people. Very good people. Um, but James is a studio guy, as you know, and he was telling me that he's just crazy. Like the, the population exploded in the last few years and it's, and, and the prices of everything have gone up since, you know, it's and the, been and absolutely it, nuts. Yeah. And it's been like the last 10 years that they said that it's just been, they only moved, I think they moved there maybe four or five years ago. I don't think they've been in Nashville that long, but they're uh, planning to move back to LA. I think at some <laughs> point, because they're just like done with Nashville because it's just turned into crazy land <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's and it's gotten like that just in the last couple of years honestly like it was i mean it's always been growing a lot since i've since i've lived here but really just the last two to three years it has just exploded the floodgates have opened which you would think okay so why but then a lot more i think what you alluded to was musicianship is coming back it's not just digital artists trying to make stuff. It's people who have some skill sets coming together to collaborate because there's something to say about that. Collaboration in the same city is amazing because if you can go and grab, hey, I heard that JoJo can go play the bass and you can just grab him within an hour or two couple hours and be able to grab a good musician out of the woodwork to collaborate with you on your album 
that's amazing. And that's when really good music starts happening. You can't really do that as easy over the web. You can't just grab a musician out of nowhere and try to play a gig with them over the internet. But being able to grab some really great talent together and collaborate at, you know, late at night, there that happens in person. It really, I think it really does. And I think there's something to be said about it. Yeah, certainly. I, I think, you know, proximity is a big harbor of, of creativity. And, you know, I think um, a lot of the best records right now are using a combination of live musicians and some of the digital stuff. You know, they're starting out in the live world and then they are kind of moving and, and enhancing it with digital or vice versa. They might be starting it in digital and enhancing it with with real instrumentation and real people. But yeah, and it's it's definitely a really cool landscape right now. And then you start adding in all the Dolby Atmos stuff that's popping up and all the surround sound mixing and, and spatial audio that Apple has, you know, signed on to in the last year. All of that, we're we're now back in kind of a wild west of audio and of production. There, you know, there's a lot of really cool things that are happening that there's going to be a lot of really interesting developments as far as production and, and mixing and kind of more of the creation of records as that takes place. What is your, so spatial audio, explain to anybody out there that doesn't understand what that is and what it's bringing to the table. Yeah. So it's basically surround sound audio but not just like your normal hey i have five speakers set up it's literally supposed to feel like it's surrounding you 360 degrees any of you that have ever gone to see a movie at a dolby atmos licensed theater you know that's one of the things you can go see now is a movie that's been mixed in atmos and that is one of the true immersive audio experiences is going to see something like star Wars in Dolby Atmos. And I think they actually use something else. Cause I think, you know, George Lucas and Dolby had a falling out or whatever, but um, bad example, but you know, any, any big action, maybe Marvel might be a better, any Marvel movie or Disney, I guess star Wars is Disney anyways. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's deep all good. It's all good. Again. <laughs> yeah. Conspiracy theories. Right. Um, <laughs> so it's basically like you're sitting in the middle of the symphony orchestra, or if you were watching your favorite band, it's like you're right up there on stage with everybody surrounding you. And so a lot of these great records that have been made over the years are starting to get remixed again in this new format that will completely change how people listen to music and how they kind of experience music. And it'll be interesting to see if it, you know, if it catches on, but also becomes the next thing, because there have been a lot of formats like this that have come out and, you know, they had a lot of oomph behind them, a lot of people that were really excited, and then they kind of fell flat. So we'll see if, uh, if this becomes the next thing, but right now it looks pretty good. Like it's going to be what everybody's using here in the next uh, several years. I love it. So Gary's question for us is what do you think about the trans Siberian orchestra? Oh, I love those guys. I've seen them probably three or four times. Their show, their concert is even better than their records. I mean, if you want to go see whatever is new and exciting in the world of concert lighting, go see trans Siberian orchestra because you know, their music's cool. I, I love, you know, again, I'm a big rock fan. I love Christmas music. So you put those two things together and right. uh, yeah, yeah, you know, Christmas and rock. Who, who would have thought that that little baby Jesus would have loved, uh, you know, that you can celebrate Jesus with heavy metal. Who, who knew that you could do that? There's another one show, that, there's another one show that's been around here a lot is in Florida. So they come around here in Florida a while um, for a lot. And it's one show that I always I've always wanted to see. And I've, I've always gotten to, uh, I've always missed it. You know, what I'm saying I missed the opportunity to go. So hopefully next time they come around. Uh, I definitely want to check it out. Should definitely go because those it's a great show all around. I mean, they one 
one year when I saw them, not only did they play all of their songs and hits that, you know, get played on the radio, but then they went into like a 30 minute concert of playing arena anthems. So like they played, oh they, they played Layla, they played <laughs> oh uh, Freebird, they played, wow. I mean, like it was like 30 minutes straight of like the greatest rock arena anthems you could you could possibly hear so that's awesome uh and, and you know that for those guys that's that's probably what they really love doing right because they, they play a ton of shows in that short uh, it's like the week before thanksgiving all the way up yeah like the week after christmas and they play like two or three shows a day that's but, crazy cool yeah check those guys out if you've never seen them i mean yeah, I'm, next I'm, time I, yeah i'll have to check out and see when they they tour next or when they uh when they got some shows coming around I have yeah. nothing, uh, no, no bad uh, or ill will towards them. I think Gary, Gary asked another qu uh, question as well. Um, has there been any times where you've had like, like, okay, you've gone to a recording studio and you're like, like a one and done kind of thing. Like we're done. I, I, like a one take masterpiece kind of thing. Like, has there any been, been any of those kind of, kind of moments? I mean, Willie Nelson was like that. He played his songs one time, and he went back to his. Oh well, yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> that's a given. Uh, I mean, yeah, we we won a Grammy for that one. So <laughs> I can't. Really, I guess you can't really tell Willie Nelson like. Eh, uh. Yeah right right. He's like oh, you, you got the, you got the part. I'm going back to I'm going back to. Bed. I'd be afraid to be like that's no, not good. I would need to do that sure. again, Willie. Yeah. <laughs> one more time. That's not. That wasn't that good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. You know, cool. I think uh, I think that's it's a lot harder to do these days because of how records are made. Everybody wants to get as much information as they can. I think if we were still making records on tape, that would be more common. But I think it's really tough to be able to say, yeah, this is done. And, and most of that's due to the artist being, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm like, yeah, this is really good. We, we can use this or this is great. Like, let's be like picky and nitpicking kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's definitely changed the landscape, too. Now that artists are more educated in how records are put together, sometimes it can be a little annoying even because they're like, hey, I heard about this or I saw this. And you're like, yeah, that's not what we're doing here. Or, that's not part of your. But I want to do this. I saw it on I saw it on YouTube and I want this in my project. I want it in my project. <laughs> How funny. Well, we're going to wrap this up for us, Matt. We got a great hour with you. We totally appreciate your time. Um, James, you got any other questions for Matt? Uh, no, nah, man, it's been a pleasure. Like, I mean, uh, we, I'm pretty sure we could, we could do a whole other hour uh, uh, rocking Easily. with this. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to take up too much of your time. You know what I'm saying? I know you're a busy person and uh, you know, uh, family wise and stuff like that, you know, you got some time with them, but uh, yeah, man, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, guys. And it's been it's been amazing kind of checking out your stuff, and I always enjoy checking out new things and new artists and you know and new music. So yeah, for sure, I want about them. So I've, I've, I'll it, come back anytime. You know, anytime yeah. I get to eat dessert and uh, and hang out. That's that's my two favorite things to do. There, there we go, right there. <laughs> there um, if go. somebody is in Nashville, where would where could they catch you playing, or is there any place yeah. that you're playing your bass at? Or uh, let's see, I'm not. I don't have any gigs coming up anytime soon, but. I'm I'm usually hanging out at Omni Sound Studios there in Midtown. That's kind of my home base these days. So if you're ever in Midtown Nashville, stop by, come say hey. Door is usually always open, especially if I'm there. But uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Um, website's great. SoundCloud's a great spot. I wish I could say find me on socials, but I'm off of social media, so. We're going to try to get him coaxed out of there, though. We're going to be like, hey, we want to be your friend. Let's hear more music. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Uh, Where's yeah, all no, that music coming? Let's get, him, let's, get him, let's get him saying stuff. Well, yeah. You'll, you'll, awesome, probably find me, you'll probably find me at the bar, honestly. Go, go to the Patterson house. That's a great spot. Um, <laughs> You know, After all the music, he's, you know, he's got to have, he's yeah, got to have gotta, some downtown. He's got to let loose. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Exactly. Uh, right on right on matt that's, that's well awesome. this has been a total blast um anything last thing you would like to tell anybody inspire anybody what would you like your last words on our show to be tonight let's see man this is Putting a, on the spot. a saying this saying that my my best friend out in and now he's in monterey california but we kind of came up together back when i was living in san diego actually of all places 
and you know we would we'd always get down like oh man we're not making the kind of progress that we want we're not really getting where we want to be you know it's taking longer than we want to want it to take but we would always have a saying just just keep doing what you're doing because if you keep showing up and you keep coming back and you force people to tell you no or you force people to to, to get rid of you or any of that stuff you know it you, a lot of the reason people don't succeed in something is because they give up too early. So I think the best advice I can give is just keep doing what you're doing, keep showing up, and great things will happen. Absolutely. I love that. That's absolutely it. And on that note, my friends, we will see you next week. Thank you again, Matt. This was an absolute pleasure, and uh, we will catch you guys next week. Another great artist is coming in. And uh, you guys will have to wait and just look out for the Instagram posts and, uh, you know, marketing stuff that we're going to show you. It's got some awesome times with us yet again. We will catch up next Thursday. And, you know, we got some big stuff going on in the background. So just letting you know, we are going and cooking and we're going to be doing some major <laughs> changes here in the next couple of weeks. So some things will be changing and we look forward to you guys joining us on this journey. We'll talk to you guys soon. Rock on.